Jim Bennett, welcome to Mormon Discussion. How are you today? I'm I'm doing well. How are you, sir? I'm good, good, good. Glad, glad to, to sit with you, to have this conversation. Uh, you and I have been talking for a couple of weeks here, just trying to pit down a, a day that we could uh, pin down a day that we could just kind of sit and have a conversation about your response, which caught my eye to the CES letter. And others have tried to respond, and and I think those responses to various degrees fall short. And while I have some issues with your response, I, I also think that your response up to this point has been the most productive uh, in terms of offering answers uh, to the questions that Jeremy Runnels poses in the CES letter. But before we jump into that, I wanted to give you a few minutes just to tell the audience about who you are. Please, by all means, mention your dad. I, I want to tie that in as soon as you're done uh, giving that intro, because I've got a connection to your father as well. But um, if you don't mind, just give us kind of a maybe a brief intro of yourself. Well, sure. Uh, well, so my name is Jim Bennett, and my father, if we want to mention him right off the bat, my father is former Senator Bob Bennett. And um, and, you know, it's really interesting that we're talking about him in the context of the CES letter reply, uh, because my father passed away in 2016, and probably the last thing he read of any length was my CES letter reply that I published on April 1st, which is not a good day to publish anything you want taken seriously, is something I discovered. Uh, but, uh, he, he read it. He was, he was thrilled with it. And then he, he suffered a stroke on the 11th of April and he was gone three weeks later. But, uh, so I, you know, th this whole endeavor that I engaged in and writing this reply is forever linked in my brain to that connection with my father. So I think it's appropriate to mention him at the outset. Uh, people, tend to think that I grew up in Salt Lake because of who my father is. But the reality is that I grew up in Southern California, not too far from Jeremy Runnels. Uh, I was in Calabasas, California, which is now the land of the Kardashians. They weren't there when I was there. But uh, I grew up there, so I did not grow up in Utah. And I, um, you know, been a lifelong member of the church but, you know, when you talk about all of the kinds of uh, faith crises or, or um, encountering difficult information, that happened to me largely when I was 18 years old. I was a freshman at the University of Southern California. I was planning on being a world-famous actor. Um, maybe you've seen my movie debut in The Home Teachers, which is a really bad Mormon movie from years and years ago. <laughs> I years remember that. that. Yeah, I'm the first person they go home teach. And then they launch a turkey out my window. Okay. It's, it's, it's not a good movie. I, I, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's, but, uh, yeah, yeah, the guy who directed the movie was in my ward at the time. And he said, oh, Jim, I've got a part for you in my movie. It's a total burnout. You're perfect for it. And I went, oh, well, thanks. That's, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm the first person who came to mind. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but as a freshman at the University of Southern California, uh, I, I read The Godmakers which was sort of the CES letter of its day. It came from a different approach. It was more about convincing Latter-day Saints that Mormons weren't Christians than it was about just sort of dismantling the entire framework of Latter-day Saint theology, which is what I think the CES letter is trying to do. But uh, it really shook me up quite a bit, and I also was listening to – I don't think it's on the air anymore be, uh, it, it was called the Bible Answer Man, and it was. Do you remember? It was it was Doctor Walter Martin who wrote the book The Kingdom of the Cults, and the Mormons had a starring role. I'm gonna, I, you know, I'm not really good at uh, not saying Mormon. I'm supposed to, but I, I I hope that faithful Latter Day Saints don't get mad at me if I lapse back into my victory for Satan. And that God doesn't get offended, right? That God doesn't get offended. Uh, anyway. That's a whole other thing. But uh, <laughs> I it, I, I'm now a member of the Tabernacle Choir, and every piece of le every letter I've gotten from the Tabernacle Choir says Mormon Tabernacle Choir on it. And if you go down to the Tabernacle Choir office under the Tabernacle, there's a huge sign that says Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So as long as the church is still using Mormon, uh, if I lapse into it, I hope they'll forgive me for doing it. I think it's going to take it quite a long time to get rid of that. And I'm, but anyway, that's a whole other discussion altogether. So 
Anyway, I bumped into, I, I read the Godmakers, uh, I was listening to the Bible Answer Man, and I was deeply and profoundly uh, frustrated and shaken because they were describing a church that was a whole lot more sinister and interesting, frankly, than the, the boring church I had grown up in. And uh, one of the things that was very helpful to me was that I had a father who was very patient and was willing to listen to my questions and take them seriously. And I find it very frustrating when people are not willing to take questions seriously. Uh, candidly, I, you know, I, I listened to Elder Corbridge's latest devotional where he talks about, did you see that? Uh, yeah, I did. I listened to it and uh, read the thing first where it was like a synopsis in the church news and then listened to the audio right. as well. I, I found that extraordinarily frustrating to be honest. Yeah, me too. I, 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 ju I just thought, you know, we, we, we don't live in an age where, I mean, the, the message seemed to be one, if you encounter difficult information, it's because someone's trying to deceive you. And two, uh, set aside all of those issues. You just need to recognize that Joseph Smith was a prophet. And once you do that, all these other issues go away. And both of those, I think, are really unproductive. First of all, people can encounter difficult issues that throw them off on the church's own website and the church's own essays. And secondly, they can, you know, when you come forward with an issue and say, you know, I, I found out uh, things about how polygamy was practiced that really, really upset me. And if you come back and just say, well, you just need to recognize Joseph Smith was a prophet, I, I think you drive people away. I, I'm much more comfortable with Elder Ballard's approach, which he outlined in his talk to CES teachers back in 2016, where he said, gone are the days where we can just bear our testimony and, and think that that's going to answer all the questions. I, I just don't think that's productive. I don't think that's helpful. And the one of the things that was really helpful to me when I encountered the God makers, not just talking to my father, but I, I came back to Salt Lake City. My family had moved up, up to Salt Lake City right after I graduated from high school. And I came up from USC up to Salt Lake and just out of the blue, the elders quorum was passing out copies of a book called The Truth About the God Makers by Gil Gilbert W. Sharfs, who I'd never heard of. Uh, but I, I read it, and it was essentially a line-by-line -line response to the Godmakers. And I thought, okay, even if I don't agree with Gilbert W. Scharf's answers, uh, I, I can recognize that somebody has taken these questions seriously enough to prepare a response to them. And many of the answers I thought were very helpful, and some of them necess weren't necessarily. I don't even remember the specifics. But what I remember is just being grateful to realize that there were people out there that were taking these questions seriously. And ever since then, I have felt a responsibility to look at essentially both sides of the issues and and confront these kinds of things head on. I don't think anybody benefits when these questions are dodged. I don't think anybody benefits when somebody's faith is questioned when they're asking questions. You know, you encounter, you know, Jeremy Runnels, and I don't necessarily understand, I, I, I don't agree with this particular objection, but Jeremy Runnels was really shaken up by the idea that Joseph Smith used a rock in the hat to translate the Book of Mormon. And, the, you know, just saying, well, uh, how dare you ask that question, doesn't answer it. You, you need to be able to confront it. You need to be able to say, okay, well, what's the issue here? What can we do to talk about this? And I, I just don't think the church and we as members of the church have a choice in the matter about doing things like that. I, I, I think we've reached a point where all of this information, you know, did, did you serve a mission? I did not, my friend. You, you joined the church at 17, so that... 17 years old, and then, uh, you know, had the chance to serve a mission, but didn't quite understand what all that meant, and didn't do it at the time. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you know, on my mission, people would encounter a lot of this... In when, when you start teaching an investigator, almost magically, 
these weird little pamphlets would show up on their doorstep from ministers they hadn't seen in years. And they talked about the Adam God theory and all this other stuff as to why Mormonism was a cult. And back then, back 30 years ago, when I was a missionary, that was really the only way people would be exposed to this kinds of information. And today they can get on their laptop and they just type in a question and something comes up that can totally break their shelf. And we can't, we can't react to that the same way we did 30 years ago. I, I, I listened to Elder Corbridge's devotional and thought this would be a great message from 1989. But in 2019, it doesn't work. So anyway, uh, I have five kids. Uh, I, um, I, I work for a web startup, canonizer.com, which is where I'm now posting my my new version of my reply to Jeremy Runnels. And uh, it's kind of a Wikipedia meets Reddit sort of thing. And I don't necessarily need to get into the specifics and particulars of that, but uh, I still haven't decided what I'm going to do when I grow up. I ran for Congress two years ago. I started a new political party. I have done all kinds. But uh, where, where I may have met you, I think, is for five years I was the artistic and marketing director at the Tuacon Center for the Arts down in St. George. Yeah, it's in my backyard. So it's we, right uh, there in your backyard. We've been there a few times. Uh, the the Christmas thing that they do that everybody shows up for is gorgeous. We've the been Festival to, of Lights. Yes, yeah, we've been to Beauty and the Beast. We've been to a couple of other plays. Uh, just a really unique space to watch a theatrical production. Right, right. Yeah, I, I have not seen a show there since I was there. So it's been, I, I, I left Tuacon in 2004. So it's been it's been 15 years since I've actually seen a show there. I directed Guys and Dolls that summer, and that's the last thing I did down there. Gotcha, gotcha. We uh, we didn't move here until 2015, so we, oh. we were like ships probably passing through the night uh, a decade apart. So There was a decade apart be- between the ship passing. Yeah, you but, but, you, but you work at Family Pond, do you not? I do. I manage the Hurricane store uh, okay. out of the four stores, and just a great company to work for. And really I just remember it. all the, the radio ads, a pond shop for everyone, Family Pond. And, and we're the ones that uh, keep you from watching your movie a little sooner. Oh, yeah. All of our ads are at the beginning of the movies. Thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we stopped you. Us and Sun River. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Do you I, still use that jingle? They they do. Yeah, we still use oh, that jingle. Okay. Uh, it's the place where every kid gets a free toy. Yeah. Nice. So, um, very and, nice. Yeah. And I appreciate all of that. Like you've already set a wonderful tone for this conversation by acknowledging that Elder Corbridge's talk falls deeply short. You point out, I mean, it's, it's a, he's charismatic. I think the talk is delivered beautifully. He comes sure. across kind of from that Bruce R. McConkie era. Right. Um, maybe kind of the well, end of that, you know, in the nineties well, and the I, church I is wanna, doing well. While I'm thinking of it, I, I, I read the transcript of your disciplinary council and you mentioned that McConkie Mormonism is dead and yeah. that Joseph Fielding Smith Mormonism is dead. And yeah. that, that was really interesting to me. My second mission president was Joseph Fielding McConkie. Yes. Uh, son of Bruce R., grandson of Joseph Fielding Smith. Answers to gospel questions. Answers to, answers to gospel questions. Uh, I loved President McConkie. Uh, he passed away just a few years ago. Um, but what you're talking about there, I can fully understand your frustration with. Uh, I, I remember I was, I was madly in love with an evangelical Christian, and she went out and got a copy of Mormon Doctrine. And said, oh, is this what your church believes? And I went, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I said, well, there's some problems with this and problems with that. My great-grandfather is David O. McKay, who was not a big fan of McConkieism. No, there was some conflict there. There was some conflict there. And, and you know, when Mormon Doctrine was first published, the David O. McKay had the uh, general authorities go through it. And I think they, they found over a thousand doctrinal errors that they consider to be doctrinal errors. And so, so I, I can fully understand the frustration with that. So I, I jumped in and I, I, I'm not sure where I cut you off, but I want you to get back to what you were trying to say before I did. Yeah, no, no, no biggie. Um, so Elder Corbridge's talk oh. was frustrating, which I, you agreeing with that is I think a huge step to the listener and saying like, Oh, okay, this guy gets it. So I appreciate that. 
Um, your father, Bob Bennett, wrote the book Leap of Faith, and uh, I just want to tell the listeners, like, if if you're in a place where you, you're starting to see this messiness and you're wanting to hang on, I, I honestly, uh, Jim, I can't recommend a better book than Leap of Faith. What it did for me was it gave me a chance to look at the Book of Mormon at some deeper levels. There were ideas in there about, you know, Nephi didn't have any children and some of that kind of kind of the the hidden context uh, of the Book of Mormon was a lot of the stuff your dad spent time on. And uh, I thought it was just deeply creative. I thought it was, um, there was enough of the material that he's pointing at to actually give substance to the conclusions he was drawing. And he opened up the Book of Mormon to me in a completely new way that allowed me to go back in and go like, oh, the critics are raising questions of historicity, but there's this deeper level that gets me to hold on. And that book uh, helped me to produce a couple of early episodes in the podcast, which I, I sent to you, but I want the listeners to to know, like your dad was deeply influential in my diving deeper and getting out of a binary world where things are black and white and starting to see the Book of Mormon, Mormonism, and then the world in this kind of more colorful context. Well, I, I very much appreciate hearing that. It's, it's interesting because bookofmormoncentral.org has contacted me and I'm actually recording an audio version of the book for them. So I think they're going to start making videos based on my audio uh, and um, sorry about that. They're, they're going to start making video out of my audio, and and so I'm immersed in this book again. And I I think this, if you were trying to find a a description of where my faith is, uh, I think you you couldn't find any better description of it than my father's book. Uh, for me, the Book of Mormon is the anchor to my faith. And, and you know, if I go back to Elder Corbridge, he, I think he was trying to make that message, but he was, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was clear. But for me, the idea that the the Book of Mormon is sort of the access point to the divine that that keeps me connected to the church. I, you know, and and my father's approach to the Book of Mormon. It, it really is interesting. The thing that I think is fascinating is when he starts talking about all of his Howard Hughes experiences. You know, yeah, very good. Howard yeah. Hughes. Howard Hughes. People don't necessarily realize this, but the only people Howard Hughes trusted were Mormons. His entire inner circle were members of the church, and and they were the people who were with him twenty four seven as he was in exile in Barbados for the last years of his life. But he goes into the forgeries that were involved with Howard Hughes. You know, there was a guy who wrote the autobiography, quote unquote, of Howard Hughes that was a complete forgery. But the process he used to do it, he relied on a manuscript, an unpublished manuscript that had information about Howard Hughes that other people wouldn't have had. And there were things in that book that people expected to find there. And Howard Hughes was weird enough that the general public believed that he might just do something strange, like write an autobiography that he wasn't telling anybody about and sneaking off to meet with somebody. Uh, and there's also the Hughes will Melvin Dumar and Melvin and Howard, you know, the movie Melvin and Howard. It's based on the idea that this guy met Howard Hughes hitchhiking in the Nevada desert. And then Howard Hughes wrote a will leaving him one fourteenth of all of his assets and this will was actually left on the doorstep of church headquarters back in the day. And and there, there are glaring errors in the will that make it clear that it's a fraud. For instance, Howard Hughes talks in the will, not Howard Hughes, but the fake Howard Hughes, the fraudulent will, mentions the Spruce Goose, which was Howard Hughes's massive airplane that only flew once. And that was a name that was given to it by the press that Howard Hughes hated. Howard Hughes would never have used the term spruce goose in his own will. And so that was very clearly evidence that the will was fraudulent. So he goes through that and, and he talks about how the Book of Mormon, uh, unlike the Hughes forgeries, the Hughes forgeries now, as we look at them in the 21st century, look increasingly ridiculous, whereas the Book of Mormon, there are still things that are considered anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. 
But the remarkable thing about them is that there are fewer anachronisms now than there were when the book was published. And frauds and forgeries don't work that way. Frauds and forgeries look more and more ridiculous as time passes. In the Book of Mormon, actually, there are more things in its favor than there were at the time that uh, it was published. So Beautiful. And, and I love all this setup. Um, I want to say one more thing, and then I want to ju start jumping into the first issue. And you and I have agreed that we'll sit down, I'm hoping at least three times, and maybe more if it needs to tie up some loose ends. Right. Um, and, and so I hope you'll be patient with me as we do this. I think this conversation, being balanced and being kind, is going to be deeply helpful to people who have questions as they're, as they're running into this stuff. So the last thing I want to say is, regarding Elder Corbridge, it's this idea of putting a divide between the orthodox believer and then this person who has questions who's now getting into the messiness and it feels like at times the church is wanting these two people to see each other as enemies right and as you point out like this idea of tackling questions you pointed to elder ballard uh in his uh address to the ces uh, uh teachers and this idea that we shouldn't avoid questions and then elder oaks and elder ballard give this uh fireside maybe eight months ago or so at this point. And Elder Oaks laughs with Elder Ballard as he says, you know, those questions we don't have good answers to, those are the ones we're going to avoid. And I think we'd also have to be honest, there may be some of these questions that there is no answer to. Yes. Those, I think, would be the ones we avoid. I uh, gave a talk on, uh, on the plan of salvation at, at conference and I tried to stay away from the questions we don't have answers to because the <laughs> Lord hasn't revealed a lot of that. And what feels like to the doubter is that the leadership doesn't want to really talk about any of these problematic questions. We're only mentioning them at a surface le level. We say we have good answers to them, and then we don't really want to get into them. And so when Elder Oak says, I want to avoid the questions we don't have good answers to, and then we avoid all of the messy questions— that message that comes across to the doubter is, see, look, these there aren't good answers to these questions. Now, you're suggesting that you know there might be better answers than maybe some of these guys are wanting to, uh, they believe that there is or that they're able to share. And so today, I wanted to jump into some of these issues, get as far as we can. Well, uh, I, I don't think we're going to... I, I have not, I just want to jump in here. I, I have not seen that... Uh, that I, I was not aware of that fireside that took place eight months ago or, or what President Oaks had said. Yeah, and I'll be happy to send it to you when we're done. I thought the line was – it hurt me because people with doubts, if you're going to start addressing things and, – and they asked uh, the crowd beforehand, like the, the audience and then the audience that would be listening, like submit questions beforehand. Oh, right. I do remember that. I do remember and you, that. And you I could did, read through these questions and most of the questions people are asking really tough stuff. Right. And they avoid all of that. And it feels like we're, it's intentional to stay away from any of the messiness. But, but on some level, as you point out, we've got to start honoring – if we're going to say questions are honored, we have to start honoring questions. Well, I, I agree with that. I, I, want, I want to back up just a little bit. I've actually been in a Facebook – I'm in a Facebook group uh, where people are talking about uh, Elder Corbridge's talk. And, and I said at the risk of being the skunk at the party, I think this, it was kind of awful. And I, I, so that started a back and forth with, with people and we were talking about some of the things we were saying. But I, I think it's important to realize that, uh, that the leadership of the church uh, are human beings with agency. And agency and infallibility are entirely incompatible. And I think once you recognize that, it becomes a whole lot easier to be able to find common ground because – you don't have to say, well, either these people are are demigods or they're devils. Uh, that's the kind of black and white thinking that I see all over, I, I still see in the church, and I see all over the CES letter. It's, oh, well, these people weren't perfect. These people weren't demigods, so they must be devils. And every chance you have to be able to try to figure out why they say what they say Jeremy Runnels always takes the worst possible assumption. It's never possible that Joseph Smith made an honest mistake or that Brigham Young made an honest mistake. It's always that they were deliberately trying to deceive. And so uh, I don't know what President Oak said on that occasion, but I look at, at 
the leadership of the church and how they're dealing with how the world has changed, how the information age has made it impossible for the church to be able to conduct business the way they did when I was a missionary. And I think a lot of that is coming from not necessarily, oh, we don't want to answer these questions or we're afraid to answer questions, but rather from, we don't know how to do this. We don't know how to deal with this. We've never had to deal with this before. This is right. It's thrown them off too. I, so I think, I think, I think that that was President Oaks being somewhat candid, but at the same time, I, I think he was trying to, uh, and maybe failing, but trying to put people at ease and just say, look, yeah, we recognize there are tough questions out there. And frankly, we don't know how, you know, in my back and forth in this little Facebook group, this guy says, well, what do you suggest? Do we have a class where all we do is go through all of these difficult questions? And I thought, well, that might be kind of unwieldy and that might be kind of difficult, but maybe that's an, I don't know. I don't have the answers and I don't necessarily think the leaders of the church have all of the answers. I think we're all trying to find it out together, but I, I just think it's important that we give everybody the benefit of the doubt, and I think that includes the leadership of the church. I don't think uh, these men are 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 any better than we are. I believe that I have as much direct access to heaven and that you have as much direct access to heaven as Russell M. Nelson does. But I don't think they're worse than we are either. I think that they are good men who are trying their best to fulfill the responsibility that they have been given. And if they come up short and they make mistakes that doesn't shatter my testimony. And I think it shatters some people's testimonies. And I think we do a huge disservice to members of the church when we try to teach them that these people are perfect because they aren't perfect. They're just like us. They are human beings. And if you're relying on their perfection to be able to base your testimony on that, you're going to be disappointed at some point down the road. Uh, let's jump into, and I, and I agree with you. Like uh, I think you'll find, I hope a listener finds because I'll be pointed when I think the data is super strong, but I, I don't want to pick on the little things. And I'll give one example before I jump into an issue. There's places early on in the CES letter, as you pointed out, Jeremy doesn't start off with his strongest arguments. And I think the way in which you handle uh, some of the stuff, and I'll, and I'll just mention one, which is the uh, edition of the King James Bible that is uh, the language in the Book of Mormon. Right. I, I just think that's not a hill I want to spend any time on because uh, I think the argument uh, is not one of the major issues. It's not a place that uh, that for me, I feel like uh, I need to stay on that hill and fight to die on it. It just doesn't seem an important hill, and I think your response to it is satisfactory. Okay. So uh, the same thing with the uh, the geography. I think the geography is... Uh, a weaker argument. Well, he's admitted that repeatedly in public. Yeah, and I don't yeah. know why it's still in there. It's it's really, it's really a deeply shaky argument. He keeps talking about the lands of Joseph Smith's youth uh, being this yeah. two thousand mile radius, and so I point out that that's as close to where he grew up as Keokuk, Iowa, is. And right. you know how right. <laughs> how would he consider Keokuk, Iowa, one of the lands of his youth? Anyway. Right. No, no, I agree. The, the only reason I would find that issue pertinent is that just as the apologists find NHM in the exact right spot, which I agree is um, a really strong coincidence to the point where it holds up as some level of evidence, not proof, but evidence. But at the same time, it's just as easy to go into Joseph Smith's environment. And if we only take the three most used consonants out of one of these words and look in the right place, I I'm sure we can find those kinds of things. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, except, you know, Nahum is in exactly the right place for it to actually sure. be evidence. And the maps that Jeremy Runnels uses in the CES letter are not in the right place. You know? Right. But, but I'm saying you, if you only need one of them, let's just say one of his. Oh. If you say there's like one word that's in the right spot in the general read, you know what I mean? It, it, it becomes – sometimes we, we hang our hats on things like Nahum or uh, chias, chiasmus. Um, and at the same time, like maybe it's not as strong – for instance, I'll give, I'll give another one, which is Alma. Alma is this uh, female name. It's in the Book of Mormon as a male name. Right. 
forever, apologists have made the argument that, look at that, Joseph, you know, he would have known Alma as a female name, and yet the Book of Mormon authors use it as a male name. And at this point, we now know that Alma was also a male name um, in the Americas at the time of Joseph Smith. And so I just want to be careful. Again, I grant that on some level, it does have evidence of some strength or another. I don't want to say like completely throw it out the window, but only that sometimes the apologists give these things as stronger than they are, and they fail to acknowledge why that evidence is also maybe weak from another angle. Well, I, I can understand that. I think, though, when you start talking about things like this, we end up straining at gnats and swallowing camels. Uh, the, the, central, sure. the, I mean, the central premise of my father's book, for instance, is that uh, he, he, he says, so let me back up a little bit. My father suffered his fatal stroke on the 11th of April, and on the 10th of April, he stood up and gave his final fireside uh, about the Book of Mormon. And the thesis of that fireside was, somebody wrote it. And he said, that seems very obvious. He says, but any, and in the book he says, any uh, explanation for how the Book of Mormon came to be requires some kind of leap of faith. Uh, of course, it's Amen. the responsibility yeah. of the church to defend the, the official version of how the Book of Mormon came to be. But from my perspective, there has not been a credible uh, alternate explanation as to how the Book of Mormon was written. The, the Book of Mormon is the tangible miracle at the center of the Restoration, which is where my faith is grounded, because I have not seen an adequate explanation from anybody else as to how anybody in the 19th century could have written this book under these circumstances and have it survive the test of time the way the Book of Mormon has. So when we start saying, okay, well, Alma was a male name at the time of Joseph Smith, I say, okay, so Alma, all right, let's say Joseph Smith, you know, wrote the Book of Mormon as, as fiction, and he borrowed the name Alma. That still does not explain the 265,000 words that were dictated without revision and sent to a publisher in a really miraculous sort of way I mean, it, it, you, you start saying... No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, Joseph Smith, if the Book of Mormon is not historical, right. then what Joseph pulled off was a level of genius that puts him in maybe the top three or four uh, most incredible acts uh, of, of intelligence and cohesiveness that I've ever seen. Right, right. And, and yeah. so, so, so I think particularly the, from my perspective, the CES letter is, is weakest with regard to all of its attacks on the Book of Mormon. And what I don't think Jeremy recognizes is that as he adds additional attacks, he weakens the argument for each of them. When he says, okay, book, the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the view of the Hebrews. Also, the Book of Mormon was plagiarized from the first book of Napoleon. Also, the Book of Mormon... Right, the more he does, the more genius he makes well, Joseph And the more it becomes, okay, well, which is it? Pick one. And, and, if, right. and if it's all of these, then you have this, this picture of Joseph Smith sort of pouring over all of these source materials and digging through all of these maps. And, With and photographic sure memory. Of, right. I mean, it, it just becomes, okay, you're, you're creating a miraculous circumstance that almost requires an angel. You know, that's almost as miraculous as what Joseph <laughs> said it was. And, you know, so... Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so, no, no. Uh, so that, that, that really is where my faith continually comes back to. And I don't think as we go through my reply that people get a sense of that, that, that for instance, I mean, I recognize that the argument against the book of Abraham, for instance, is much stronger than any argument against the book of Mormon. Uh, but I, 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 what I don't talk about when I talk about the, the responses to the book of Abraham is that I'm willing to give Joseph Smith the benefit of a whole lot more doubt because the Book of Mormon is so powerful, and the Book of Mormon is such a powerful witness to me, not just of Christ but, and of all the doctrines that it teaches, but of the reality of the Restoration and the reality of Joseph Smith's prophetic mission. And so that, that I think, biases me. I recognize that it does, but I think that's what it's supposed to do. It biases me in favor of accepting an explanation 
for any other problem, you look at Joseph Smith and go, well, geez, why did this happen? I keep coming back to the Book of Mormon and saying, look, the Book of Mormon came from somewhere. Somebody wrote it. And I I have a witness that it was written exactly the way that Joseph Smith said it was written and that it is exactly what it claims to be. And so that gives me enough of a, of a, of a base to be able to confront these other issues. And I think that's kind of the message Elder Corbridge was trying to give. And I don't think he did it effectively. But anyway, so I'm one. No, over the place. Amen. So let's start off. I want to talk for a little bit about treasure digging. Right. We're, we're 40 minutes in now, and we, here we go, first right. issue. Um, so treasure digging, I'll tell you. So again, I am somebody who from the age of 17 till the age of 32, Mormonism worked, as Elder Uchtdorf said, it worked wonderfully. Right. Um, and from 32 on, Not so wonderfully. I, be, I began, yeah, it didn't work so well. And I begin to sense that we also hurt people that we um, claim to be the best source to get information, but have continually have to revise our narrative. Uh, and, and in doing that, I've lost a lot of trust. And so here's, here's my perception of treasure digging. And then I want to hear your perception, and then maybe we can ask a question sure. to, to each other. So Joseph Smith, from the age of approximately at least 13, maybe younger, and he comes from a family that's also involved in folk magic, Joseph Smith at 13 uses Sally Chase's uh, green seer stone, finds his own seer stone. He, he claims that it's 150 miles away under a tree. He some you know must must obviously leave and then comes back and he has this stone. He uses this stone to tell people where their lost items are. Uh, we don't have a huge record of what that looked like. We have a story or two, for instance, where Martin Harris. Uh, drops a, a, a pen and some like a little pen and some hay or something, and Joseph helps him locate it. We've got a story of Josiah stole uh, Joseph describing the stole property before he actually arrives there, um, but we don't have much beyond that. What we also have are these stories of Joseph then going from being a lost item finder to uh, helping people locate buried treasures. Uh, buried Spanish bullion, silver mines, gold. And the church portrayed it as this was just something Joseph did for just a brief little bit. Joseph himself says that, you know, he got $14 a month and it, he gave it up quickly. Mm -hmm. So as I dove into the data, what I come across then is Dan Vogel's dialogue article, which shows that there were 17 prominent digs in the Palmyra and surrounding area that the Smith family uh, primarily with some others also uh, involved in. Uh, we understand this idea of the folk magic and I know there's some debate about magic circles and slitting dogs throats. I actually find there to be enough pointing to that to see it as credible. Um, I know that that's debatable so we so we can either set that aside or we can tackle that at some point but what we do know is that Joseph on multiple occasions, not just a month's worth of $14 a month, but over the course of years. So again, Joseph paints it as a small thing, and it seems to be much more prominent uh, than he wanted us to think. So again, there's this moment of going like, why not just tell me the full story? Joseph is getting groups of people together as a young boy up until his early adulthood, and he is taking them out on these digs. And it's not like they're digging a six-foot hole in the ground, but instead, there's still pictures of some of these caves in Palmyra that they dug. It's going to a hillside, and it's digging, you know, multiple feet in, 20 feet in, and digging, you know, 15 feet wide. It's almost like digging out a cave in this hill. And what would happen is Joseph would say, look, I see the treasure, and now the treasure, now you're getting close and we didn't do the circle right or we didn't say the spell right or the guardian angel uh, gets involved and, and now this treasure has sunken further into the earth. I'm going to assume, and, and you're, I'm going to give you a moment here to talk. I, I'm going to let you correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to assume that you agree there never was any kind of Spanish treasure buried. There was no bullion. There was no silver mine. There was no gold like this. Right. Um, and on some level, whether Joseph is really believes that stuff is there, or whether he's deceiving people, it looks like a deception. 
And um, the other thing that I, I run into a problem. So there's this long history of what looks like deception. There's also Joseph painting it as no big deal when it really was much more prominent than he said it was. And then on top of that, what I have is treasures of precious metals buried in a hill, protected by a guardian spirit, and um, dis- worked out with the help of a seer stone. Then I go forward to the Book of Mormon and I find gold plates, a golden treasure, buried in a hill, protected by a guardian spirit, and involves the use of a seer stone. And I start to see what I think is a pattern where Moroni becomes a guardian spirit, and it feels to those who start to dive into this, and it felt to me as if Joseph was simply doing more of what he'd already done. Now, I had one more little caveat, which is from the age of 13, Joseph seems to have the ability to take a group of people and convince them of something, have them to one degree or another see what he sees, when in reality that did not exist, because that comes in later with the witnesses and other issues. And I'll stop there. That feels like a good synopsis of what us as those who are either critics or doubters, right. what we perceive in that story. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, um, have you have you ever seen the book A Reason for Faith? Uh, yes, this is the Laura Hale's, Laura Hale's uh, compendium. Uh, yeah, uh, the first the first. Um, I should probably go dig it up, but because because I I don't have access to the kind of primary sources that would give detail to to any of this. Uh, but the first essay in that book is written by Richard Bushman, and it's called Joseph Smith and Treasure Digging, and he goes through a lot of this and goes through the history of this, and uh, the things that I take out of that. Uh, the first question is what actually happened. And the second question is, is how much does it matter? And uh, and I, I look at it from the second question first, because uh, to some degree, I don't care much uh, if Joseph Smith, for instance, believed that he could find buried treasure. I don't care if Joseph Smith believed in folk magic, um, because I, I don't see anything inherently sinister about either of those things. I think they're kind of foolish. I think they're like um, people who believe in horoscopes. Uh, you know, when my, my wife was a missionary in Chile, she said that everybody in Chile had a brown paper bag in the middle of their house because that kept insects away. And she said, and also you weren't supposed to drink um, a cold drink on a hot day or a hot drink on a cold day, because that would turn you choico, which she says translates as crooked, that you're going to lose your mind if that happens. And that's nonsense. You're not going to lose your mind if you drink a hot drink on a cold day. Uh, People do that all over the place. I served my mission in Scotland where that's all they do. It's always a cold day and they always drink hot drinks. Uh, But the fact that people believe something that silly, I don't think precludes them from from, uh, you know, being righteous, decent people. It just means they believe silly things. I think they're members of the church. We believe a lot of silly things uh, that aren't doctrinal, that don't make a lot of sense. And so, you know, if Joseph Smith, and, and I, think, I think it's undoubtable that Joseph Smith did believe in a lot of those things, uh, I, I don't see that as in any way disqualifying of him being a man of integrity. Now, but then that gets back to issue one, which is what really happened. And if what really happened is that Joseph Smith is out deceiving people and lying to people, uh, that would be more disqualifying. I don't think, in my understanding of the documents, that that is a that that is a, I think that is a case that you can make if you want to make that case. But I don't think that the um, the primary documents. Uh, are strong enough that give us enough information to know exactly what's happening. I mean, I, if Joseph Smith is is deceiving people, uh, it's a really lousy con to lead them to treasure that doesn't exist, because Joseph Smith doesn't get a payoff from that either. You know, if, if well, I know that where there's a silver mine, only there's no silver, so I don't get anything. All Joseph gets out of that is the fourteen dollars a month, and you know, so the the records we have. 
Um, most of them have come to light, I think, relatively recently. I, I, I'm a big fan of a book. Have you ever heard of the book The Myth Makers by Hugh Nibley? It's incorporated into now, uh, I think it's sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Uh, but uh, the center of the book is the trial that Joseph Smith undertook for being a disorderly person. And Hugh Nibley dismisses it because he says there's no record of the trial. And he was right when he wrote that book. There is no record of the trial. There is now. Uh, those records have come to light in, in recent years. There was an 1826. It wasn't, but it wasn't a trial. It was a hearing on the basis of Joseph Smith being accused of being a disorderly person. And all charges were dismissed when Hosiah uh, Stowell was testified and said Joseph Smith's a great guy. And that was the end of it. So, you know, you look at that and say, okay, uh, I, I think you can read whatever you want to read into that. And if you are predisposed to thinking that Joseph Smith is a scoundrel and a liar, uh, that can serve to some degree as confirmation bias of that. But I don't think that that is the only way to read that evidence. I don't think it's irreducibly true to say that Joseph Smith was a con man in his youth, because I don't think we have enough information to be able to draw that conclusion. And when you say you see a pattern between, okay, you know, he was looking for buried treasure, and he eventually found a buried treasure that was the Book of Mormon, that were the golden plates, and all of that was, was consistent with his youthful experience, I look at that and say, uh, that's the Lord using the, the culture and the context of a person's time to be able to prepare them to receive greater light and knowledge. Uh, I think you know, one of the reasons why I'm not troubled by the fact that Joseph Smith used a seer stone in a hat to translate the Book of Mormon is that it's very clear to me that the Lord said, okay, you believe this kind of goofy little thing. I'm going to use that in a way that will make you more comfortable and give you you know, some kind of connection to this that you wouldn't have had otherwise. The, the first section of the Doctrine and Covenants talks about the Lord speaking to his servants in their weakness after the manner of their language. And I think that treasure hunting and folk magic is part of the 19th century language. I, I, I don't think it was as disreputable as, as people now sort of seem to think it is. And the Bushman essay at the beginning of A Reason for Faith talks about that. As he says, you go back and, and look at it now, and historians are far less troubled by this now than they were 50 years ago. Because the kind of presentism that we bring to our assessment of, the, of, of upstate New York in the 1820s uh, has kind of gone away in academic circles, and it, it just wasn't that outrageous to believe in folk magic in the 1820s. So that's kind of my perspective on it, and that probably isn't going to change anybody's mind, but I, I, don't, I don't find it particularly troubling. Gotcha. So I'm trying to think how to kind of dive into that a little deeper. Um, so if I and again, it's, it's the, the, these conversations are tough because one thing that's happening is there's this insider outsider perspective, right? So as an insider who's a believer, we're going to place more weight on faithful answers that have some level of reasonability to them. As an outsider, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to find uh, a critical perspective. Uh, that seems reasonable, and we're going to add more weight to that. And I, I, I think that's um, unavoidable to some extent. But then it also causes, say, you or me to talk past each other right. a little bit. And I want to try to, I want to try to um, meet in the middle as much as we can. But I also realize that meeting in the middle in some ways is actually a loss for the faithful perspective, right? <laughs> like if you grant me half the issues and I grant you half, you lose. Well, no, I, well, the thing is I'm happy to grant you that your interpretation of the records about Joseph Smith's treasure digging um, are valid. Not valid in the sense that they are, they are absolutely accurate because I don't think we have enough information to be able to make a definitive determination there. But I think it is reasonable if you are – if if, if you want to be believe that Joseph Smith was a con man and a deceiver, I, I think you can find evidence to support that position and how you interpret the data 
from the, the, the very sparse data that we have. Uh, uh, right. Uh, no, no, I but agree. I, I, on the flip side, I think it's entirely reasonable to interpret the, that data the way a believer would interpret it, which is to say that it was sort of an, at least this believer, me, I interpret it as saying that it, it was a harmless superstition of the time that was common at the time and that uh, I, I don't see anything particularly sinister about it. I never really have. I mean, th there are a number of things that I have been troubled by in church history and troubled by in church practice. Uh, this isn't one of them. So, so, so I, am, I, I am more than happy to cede to you the idea that the way you're looking at this data, I, I think you can make a case that, that can be defended, that your interpretation is correct. I don't agree with your interpretation. I don't think you have proof. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that always frustrates me, too, is that very often when you start talking, and it's not just with regard to the claims of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but when you talk to atheists, they say there is no evidence for God. And I say, no, there is a great deal of evidence. There is no proof of God. And that's a very different thing. You know, and 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 I, I think that a lot of believers are not comfortable uh, acknowledging the possibility of that kind of uncertainty. No, no, I, yeah, totally. So, so, so there is no proof. We, I cannot prove to you that the Book of Mormon is a historical document; that it is what it claims to be. I think there is evidence that there is, uh, but I, I don't think mortality is an experience where we have been given. We've been given an experience where we are not supposed to have this kind of proof. I think we've been sent here in order to be able to see what we are going to do when we don't have our Heavenly Father looking over our shoulder 24 hours a day and knowing that. I mean, we have to have faith in him. We have to be able to exercise our own moral judgment. So, so no, I'm happy to be able to say, yeah, if you want to see Joseph Smith in a bad light, this you can find that in this. I think you can also find the other conclusion too. Right. No, no. I grant all that. Love it. Um, cause I think that's going to play out in every one of these issues. And so it's, there's this big overarching thing, which is looking at it both as an insider and as an outsider, we're seeing a behavior that we're agreeing on. And then the interpretation of that behavior becomes different. Right. But I want to hit a couple things specifically. And the other thing too, is I recognize is if I ask you a question like, do you still beat your wife? Right, right, right. Like you can't just say yes or no. Right. Um, that that's not a I question. You the can... question needs to be challenged. And I, right. I, you know, that's the one thing I found really frustrating about the CES letter. The, it's it's riddled with when did you last beat your wife questions. Right, and and so nobody can answer yes or no. Now it takes forty five minutes to get into like no. Let's slow down. Let's back up. Here's what you asked. Here's why it doesn't work. I get all that. Right. Um, I, I preface this next question, the next couple of questions with that comment, because I'm hoping you can say yes or no. And I recognize maybe you won't be able to, because it may be that kind of a question to you. But okay. do you, do you at least agree that Joseph Smith wants to downplay his treasure digging as this much smaller thing than what it actually was in his life? I don't think there's any question that that's true. I think okay. that's absolutely true. Beautiful. But, but I, I also want to back up and say that's what all human beings do. You know, when we are embarrassed by something, when, when there's something, there are plenty of things in my childhood that I don't want to talk to you about or I don't want to talk to anybody about. It's not that they were criminal or they, they were terrible. It's that they're kind of embarrassing and I don't want to talk about them. And I, I, this is this, I think, gets to the idea of of infallible leaders. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it means, I don't think it's any kind of indictment of Joseph Smith to say that he didn't want to talk about embarrassing things in his childhood. I think that's the way all human beings function, but you're right. Absolutely. I think it's very clear that Joseph Smith was trying to, to, to play it down. And I think it's very clear that the church has been trying to play it down. Yeah. And, and even to the extent We'll get into this hopefully at some point when we talk about the Book of Mormon translation, because I, I too agree with you, uh, whether Joseph Smith stood on his head and you know held on to one of the pockets of his pants right. and gave us the Book of Mormon makes no difference if God's behind it either way. It doesn't matter right. to me. Right. Uh, what I think what I think happened is that the church decided at some point, and maybe and I don't know that it's even conscious. It it could be 
it could be subconscious, um, but on some level, they avoided a frank discussion about the stone in the hat. Absolutely. Be- because it leads back to treasure digging, which I think is the more embarrassing issue. Right. No, okay. I, 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 am, I am happy to 100% acknowledge that both of those things are true. And, and I, I think, for instance, the church, this comes back to, you know, the CES letter. It's always, okay, the church has been engaged in this deliberate pattern of deception. The church has been lying to me. I mean, that's the message that keeps coming out of the CES letter. The church lied to me about the rock and the hat. And my response is, no, the church did not lie to you about the rock and the hat, but the church didn't talk about it. The church just didn't want to talk about it. If you wanted that information, you could find it. You could look for it. I mean, the church never came out and said, Joseph Smith didn't use a rock in the hat. Well, Joseph Fielding McConkie said that, actually. That's when I first learned about the rock. Right, yeah, Bruce R., Joseph Fielding Smith, and then Joseph Fielding McConkie, sure. The, but, but, I mean, they, they acknowledged the sources, and they said, we don't believe them. And I, I, right. I had a conversation with Joseph Fielding McConkie, one-on-one, talking about this. And uh, he, gave, he gave very specific reasons why the rock in the hat just didn't happen. Uh, but I don't think he was lying to me. I think he absolutely believed his position. So I, I, I think when, when you want to say, okay, has the church been lying to me? Is the church deceiving me? Or uh, is the church filled with people who don't want to talk about embarrassing things? I think uh, the law of parsimony would say that the second premise is the correct one, not the first. Right. And I um, want to grant all of that. Like, I agree with you 100% that there's a difference between um, misstating something intentionally and simply not talking about it. Now, the pushback I would give is that the church has set a certain bar for honesty. Two, so this is a twofold problem. One is that me, as a human being, there's a natural gut feeling that I feel like I deserve to have as much access to the information as possible so that I can make wise decisions in my life. And so when people run into a faith crisis... They often feel like the church intentionally withheld things, or and, and even if it's un- unintentional to some degree, there's a feeling of like, if I had known that, I would have made different decisions in my life. And so that's one part. The other part is that the church, for instance, in its Gospel Principles book, says honesty is also based on if we withhold things in order to uh, manipulate a situation to some extent, that that's also dishonesty. And I think a lot of people feel that. I don't want to go off into a tangent and have to explain all that. I just no. I just want you to sense, and I know you get it, people feel betrayed sure, because they feel like the church told one story and the data and the facts make the narrative like not just a little different, but incredibly different. And people feel like had they had all that information to begin with, they wouldn't have invested what they did into this institutional thing. I can fully understand that because that's, that was my experience at 18 years old, reading The Godmakers. It was, it was you know, th- this church I've grown up in is not the church I thought it was. And, and what made the difference for me was that I was able to talk to people who took my questions and took my frustrations seriously. And... And what I have found in the interim is, for, for instance, you say that that uh, you made a comment that if you had known some information that was it was not just different but radically different, uh, I would push back on that. For instance, I don't see uh, the rock and the hat as radically different from a pair of granny glasses attached to a suit of armor. Let me give an let me give an example. So. Um... I was I was taught a story where Joseph and Emma had an ideal marriage. I was taught a story where Joseph's father was a upright, completely like good guy, great dad. Uh, I was taught a story that Joseph had very little involvement in treasure digging. I was taught a story that Joseph used the Nephite spectacles. I was taught a story that you know Joseph 
stayed away from alcohol so strongly that even during his leg surgery, he refused to have some type of uh, alcohol to to soften the pain of the surgery. And, and what I found was that those things, those moments in time used to teach an idea, when I looked at the full scope of the data, I was led to see somebody who didn't do things the way the church wanted us to see those people doing things. I was taught that Joseph Smith uh, I, let me put it this way. I was never taught Joseph was a polygamist in church, in the correlated material. And so I was left to assume he was a monogamist. And I think anybody, uh, an outsider who comes in and looks at the curriculum from 10 years ago and earlier would go like, yeah, this guy's not married to more than one person. Like that doesn't make any sense. Like all you would have is section 132. Or if you were curious enough to go on to family search and look up the prophet, and to find that info, um, we tell a story about Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner and how she saves the Book of Commandments papers as that press is being destroyed by uh, a mob. And we tell that story about Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner, but we never disclose anywhere that she's the plural wife wife. of Joseph Smith, which, which our founder, right? Like if I'm going to read a book about L Ron Hubbard in Scientology, I'm expecting a biography or a, um, an institutional biography, which we get over dozens of years in church curriculum to disclose at the very least, as it tells me the story about her, that she's also a plural wife of Joseph Smith. It feels as if that's a more important data point that members should know than saving the book of commandments. And yet it also feels like the church at all costs outside of an information age said, let's not do that. You know, uh, I I think there's there, I I will grant you a certain degree of, uh, I I want to agree with you to a point, but not entirely. Uh, It's interesting. You mentioned L Ron Hubbard. I'm actually fascinated by Scientology. It's so delightfully strange and I really wish they would just sort of embrace the strangeness. I, I, same thing's true with the with with our church as well. But but uh, L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology uh, have written biographies about L. Ron Hubbard that are demonstrably factually incorrect and not. I mean, I mean, I mean that, that aren't just like in error. They Paint talk the about, guy as a hero in the military yeah, when he never as a so, great husband and father when he when he. Well, in some I mean, ways, mental, emotionally tortured. Yeah. physics that he does not have, right? They, they, right. they, they make false statements about him and push that forward. Uh, you're saying, okay, I was taught that Joseph Smith had an ideal marriage. Okay, well, what does that mean? What is an ideal marriage? Uh, the, the church has never, for instance, come out and said, Joseph Smith was not a polygamist. What the church has done, and I think it was a mistake to do this, is just not talk about that. I mean, the, the, I mean, I can't remember a time actually uh, when I did not know that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Um, my my, I come from a polygamous uh, line. My great my one of my great grandfathers is David O. McKay, and on the other side of my family, great grandfather is Heber J. Grant. And my grandmother was the last surviving daughter of Heber J. Grant, and Heber J. Grant had three wives. And she was raised by her sister uh, for 12 years and was not allowed to use her her real surname because she was afraid that federal agents would arrest her father for polygamy if she did. Uh, and so polygamy has been sort of a part of our family lore since as long as I can remember. And so, I, so never at any point was I ever under the impression that Joseph Smith was not a polygamist. And that's one concern that I, I can't really personally identify with, with other people, because when people come back, I'm, is it Hans Matson, the area authority who was just flabbergasted to discover Joseph Smith, the polygamist. And I thought, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how anybody can be in the mission field and not know that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Doctrine and Covenant section 132, it has been in our scriptures published, uh, you know, uninterrupted for 175 years. So so I, I look at that, but I, I recognize, yes, the church did not want to talk about things that it felt was were embarrassing. I do not think, think that is the same thing as L. Ron Hubbard saying, I have a degree in nuclear physics when he flunked out of college after one semester. I, I think 
I, I, I will be, I'm happy to say, yes, that is not the level of honesty that I want the church to rise to, but it is not the kind of dishonesty that Jeremy Runnels says it is. I, 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 I think it's a cultural aversion to embarrassment. I don't think it is deliberate deception. I don't think a cultural aversion to embarrassment is a, a great excuse. I think it's an explanation. And I, I look at the church and it, it all comes down to what do we expect from the church and what do we expect from our leaders? If we expect our leaders to be infallible, we are going to be disappointed and we are going to have our faith crushed. I think that's what the scriptures talk about is putting our trust in the arm of flesh. If we recognize that the church is made up of people with agency and people who are fallible and people who, like me, don't like to talk about the more embarrassing aspects of their lives, then I think we can look at it a little more charitably and understand what the church has done. It doesn't necessarily excuse what the church has done. And I think to the church's credit, we're making great strides. Uh, have you read Saints, the new church history? I've read uh, chapters of it, and, and I agree, although I will, again, and this is just the insider-outsider perspective, I still see our history, even in the gospel topic essays, and even in the book Saints, to some degree told in the most, like, okay, we'll disclose more facts, we'll disclose more of the issues, but I'm, we're still going to tell it in a very, you know, as faithful as we can we're not going to we're not going to present all of the messiness we're going to kind of make it sound a little better than it probably was um so i still feel that but i agree with you it's it's strides ahead of truth restored by gordon b hinckley or right. our heritage right right well i i don't know that the church can do it any other way i mean you there there is no sure when people talk about objective Historians, I don't, there's no such thing. No such thing. Right. It's not possible. It's it's not possible. Just by telling one piece of history and not telling another, history is too vast. And so, when you are selective in what history you're willing to tell, you're demonstrating some form of bias or some sort. So, the fact that the church is trying to put its best foot forward, uh, I don't think there's any other possible way to do that. I don't think the church is offering in saints and in the in the gospel topics essays and our, and the recent kinds of things that they're doing to uh, illuminate history, I don't think they're they're offering unreasonable interpretations of the facts. I, I think I think that they're entirely reasonable to be telling the story they're telling, and I think that they have made great strides. We have made great strides in confronting the issues that we have not wanted to talk about for 150 years. No, I I agree. Agree that Saints is not um, Saints is a much more reasonable way in which to tell our history. So I'm I'm going to agree with you there. My my one caveat, and I don't really want to go off in this angle. I just want to say it, and then let's move on to the first vision. Sure. Which which is the idea that if you and I, if we knew each other, we were friends, and you were asking me about important things. And I'm constantly withholding what, what you consider to be important information because I'm embarrassed. And I reserve the right to hold back things out of embarrassment or worry that you're going to misuse the information. I, I grant that. On the other side of it, I also expect you to lose trust in me if I'm not forthright with you. And so on some level, I think it's not only reasonable, I think it's appropriate for members of the church to lose trust in the institution when the institution withholds information that that person considers important. Because from my experience, I don't think that's an entirely analogous dynamic. For instance, I, I, for, I, I think it is true to say that the church in correlated materials has not brought these things up. I do not think it is true to say that when people ask about these things, the church has refused to answer. Because in my experience, I came across this information and I started asking about these things. I'd asked my father. Uh, I got answers from Gilbert W. Scharfs. Uh, so I, I didn't get these answers necessarily in general conference, but I wasn't in a position to be able to directly question the apostles in general conference. When I brought these questions that I had to people, uh, people responded with substantive answers. And I, I, 
like to hope <laughs> that I wasn't the only person that had that kind of a positive experience. So, so I, I would push back and say, uh, I, I don't think when the church is asked d- direct questions that the church has refused to answer uh, or, or has withheld information. I think, I think there are a number of people who have gone through mortality and gone through their experience in the church without ever learning anything about the rock in the hand. And I don't think it's had any bearing on their lives one way or the other. Uh, they remain blissfully unaware. They don't particularly care. Uh, the Book of Mormon has blessed their lives. And you know, whether or not it, it was it was a granny spectacles with a suit of armor or a rock in the hat, it doesn't change their experience. So they didn't have a question, and so that question wasn't answered. But it wasn't a question they had either. So I've I've early on in my faith crisis, I was communicating with Elder Holland and Marlon Jensen. Right. Uh, I had reached out to Elder Holland and I had asked him s- like six questions, seven questions, and they were they were messy questions, such as how much do leaders make? Oh, okay. and, and I and I think in our normal jobs, like if I'm you know I work for Family Pond, I don't think I owe it to anybody to tell somebody what my income is. Right. Um, on the other hand, when you are employed by the true and living Church of Jesus Christ, who in all of your public statements says we're just a lay ministry. I think you do owe, uh, on some level, that information. It shouldn't be something that's hidden. And, and again, I don't want to debate that, but that, oh, cause that wasn't I the only that's question. Fair. That's fair. It wasn't the only question. And Elder Holland's response to me was, I wish I could answer your questions. But he, but he didn't. And, and when I've um, sent questions to my stake president, in the midst of them wanting to see me in apostasy and start to move towards a disciplinary council, I said, President, could you just take these five questions and and send them up the ladder and let's see if there's a healthy mechanism to get these questions answered. And whoever he sent them up to in the 70, passed them up higher. They were sent back down. And my stake president sat with me and said, they're not going to answer your questions. They've sent them to me and told me that I'm to answer these questions for you. And I'm not going to answer these questions because I don't have any, these are above my pay grade. Mm-hmm. And so I just want to acknowledge, like on some level, I, I honor your experience that you had experience asking tough questions and people answered them. I just hope you also honor my perspective, which is I also sent questions on to people and they avoided those at all cost. Uh, that's fair. Okay. Um, I want to hit the first vision. So in okay. the first vision, again, let's do the same things. I think this is playing out really well. Oh, good. Um, let me tell you my perspective and then you tell me yours. Uh, and then we'll just, we'll talk about it for a moment. And this may be as far as we get. And I, and I hope you're, I hope you feel like we're being fair to each other. I, I certainly feel that with you. I, I do. I absolutely feel that with you. I'm very much enjoying Great. this. I hope you're having, I hope you're having fun. I'm having fun. I am. In fact, I hope we sit down 10 times and do this. Cause I think the, the listeners who are doubters or people who are out of the church, um, they're going to see what I think is a fair discussion about these issues, and then they can just make healthy decisions. Well, good. Good. Uh, in the first vision, so Joseph Smith has the 18, so it happens in 1820, whatever right. it is. Right. And I'm willing to concede that Joseph had a spiritual experience. Um, because I think most human beings, when they have a level of religious religiosity or religiousness in their in their lives, they have spiritual experiences. Right. Um, 1820, this of whatever this event is, that's when Joseph says it occurs, at least by the 1838 account. And I grant the age thing is just such a non-point to fight over. Right. Um, well, the the 1830 Frederick Williams put the wrong age in the right, 18, right. 1832 account. Yep, the 16th year. Um, so there's four accounts. The 1832 account, Joseph is writing in this in this journal. I, I, I like when I say this, I think this is true to say it's his personal journal, but sometimes that conveys that he meant entirely for this to be private. And I don't, I don't, I want to grant to the apologist or to the faithful that that's, that's too, that's going too far. We don't know. And I don't think it's fair to say that the journal was meant to be in private his entire life. Like it, it, I'm open to it being considered by Joseph to at some point be published. Right. 
but it's his 1832. It's his personal journal. Because when we hear the word journal, we think of our diary we keep in our right. uh, bed, you know, bedside, and no one's would ever look at it, and we're offended when someone opens it up. Right. So I, I don't want to play that game. Um, but the 1832 account is the earliest account. It's written in Joseph Smith's journal, his personal journal. Much of it's in his own handwriting. He tells us that he saw the Lord. There's other discrepancies, but I think they're they're not as important to me other than to say they're there and they they don't mesh smoothly uh, with for, in my mind with the 1838 account without making a bunch of allowances. Um, I don't think they're unexplainable. Um, but I see enough difference to say whatever happened in his memory of the 1832 account, his memory has changed by the time he writes the 1838 account. Um, the 1830... Well, can, can uh, you be a little more specific on that? I mean, what are, um, what's the discrepancy that you feel? Because from my perspective, uh, the only discrepancy that I think is worth talking about is is the, the mention of a singular figure in the 1832 account and the mention of the father and the son and the, all subsequent accounts. Every other, every other supposed discrepancy to me, uh, I, I don't even see what the discrepancy is. I, I, I think that the accounts mesh extraordinarily well. So, so we, we may, we may come to blows on that, I guess. <laughs> we've been, we've been so, we've been getting along so well now that I'd hate to, for this, for this to spoil it. Yeah, and and that's why I I I see all the other things as secondary. So I don't see a conflict to the degree to the degree where you say the sky is blue and I'm saying it's red. Right. It's more of where Joseph seems to place the importance of which motives were primary and which motives were secondary in going into the grove. Um, I, again, I don't see the year as a big issue. Um, it seems like Joseph is more concerned with forgiveness for his sins. Um, it also seems like there's less impetus from what he sees as answers to this vision in being that there's this new church to start up. Whereas the 1838 account seems to place as a primary importance, this idea of restoring the gospel in a forgiveness of Joseph's sins as something either unmentioned or just much further down in priority. Um, So again, I I grant that. Acknowledging that he saw the Lord, I've seen explanations of this. You know, the Lord opens the heavens and I saw the Lord and maybe God is one and Jesus is the other. That feels like we're simply backtracking to the space that no one can prove is wrong. And, and well, so on some level, when I read the 1832 account, uh, I grant that it doesn't say God, Heavenly Father was not there. At the same time, when I read it, it feels as if Joseph is conveying a message that there was a heavenly messenger, and that heavenly messenger uh, spoke to me. Does that make sense? It does. I, I want to go back, though, because I, I, I think, for instance, the apologists to some degree have this wrong. When they start talking about the explanation in terms of trying to synthesize why did he go into the grove, and this really upsets Jeremy Runnels. He says in one he says he's going in to get his sins forgiven, and another he's going in to find out which church to join. And the standard apologetic answer is, well, he was doing both. He had a list of objections. Uh, I don't believe that. I, I believe that there was one thing on his agenda. And it was, how do I get right with God? What do I need to do to get right with God? Uh, You know, what do I need to do to be saved? You know, in every single one of the accounts, you see the concern about his immortal soul. And what happens is that all of these other things uh, demonstrate what Joseph Smith's assumptions were in order to be saved. Of course, you have to join a church to be saved. Now, in 2019, there are plenty of people who will tell you you don't have to join a church to be saved, but in 1820, nobody believed that. The perspective of somebody in 1820 is, okay, I've got to join the right church. 
So when you go in and say, well, which was it? Was he, was he praying to be forgiven of his sins or was he praying to know which church to join? My answer was both of those to Joseph Smith were exactly the same thing that he had to know what it was he had to do in order to be saved and which church to join is part of that process. So I look at that as uh, this is a 14-year-old kid who's not going in there with any kind of a theological agenda. It's, oh gosh, I haven't joined a church. I don't know what I'm going to do. What do I have to do? And I'm reaching out to God for that. And, uh, and this marvelous vision unfolds. But so I look at that and say, okay, so if by 1838, Joseph understands how much more important it is to focus on the church aspect of that than he did in 1832, that doesn't strike me as dishonesty. What strikes me is, would strike me as dishonesty is if that if all four of the first vision accounts sounded exactly the same, because that's somebody who's got a story and they're sticking to it. That's L. Ron Hubbard telling the story of Xenu with specifics about the the DC-10 jets that are flying to Tegiak. I mean, oh, I mean, you have very specific. You, you you've created a story that you are recounting, and rather than recalling an actual event, when people recall actual events and they do it in different settings and at different times. It should not sound identical to each other. And uh, so I, I look at those kinds of quote-unquote differences as actual evidence that this is somebody recalling an actual memory rather than somebody who has made up a story and is trying. Uh, the idea that Joseph Smith just can't keep his story straight strikes me as a little ridiculous. Uh, by this point, he's already published the Book of Mormon, 265,000 words of a very complex, consistent book that that one of the things that the critics have no answer to is how did he keep all of these places and ideas? The Book of Mormon is consistent with itself. Whether or not it's actual history, the, the, the history that's contained in it is consistent with itself. But Joseph Smith can't remember whether or not he saw one person or two. That doesn't that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And but but you go back to the 1832 account and say, okay, well, why is there only one person and not two? And that doesn't preclude the idea that uh, that someone else was there. And, and one of the things, and this this is Jim Bennett heterodoxy, I suppose. But every time that the Father and the Son appear in Scripture, uh, it's really the Son appearing, and the Father introduces him. Uh, that happens on the Mount of Transfiguration. That happens at Christ's baptism. Uh, that happens with the Nephites. When Jesus appears to the Nephites, uh, there is a voice from heaven that is the Father talking about the sun and and doctrinally we um, we discuss the idea that um, the father only appears to bear record of the son that we are a fallen people and that we the only access we have to the father is through the son no man cometh unto the father but by me Jesus says and so I'm kind of of the opinion that, you know, we watch the first vision movies where there, you have two people standing there the whole time. And I'm kind of of the opinion that the father showed up and said, this is my son and he's going to talk to you. And then the father probably was gone, that the bulk of the vision took place one on one with Joseph and the Lord and, and Jesus. And I think that would be consistent with other scriptural accounts of how the father and the son interact with mortality, with with mortal people. And so I, I kind of look at that, Joseph saying that, and that he would remember it as, well, the, yeah, that was the experience. I spent, I, I was talking to Jesus. I was talking to the Lord. Um, and then by 1838, he realizes how significant it is that the Lord was introduced by the Father. And so that, that shows up in the 1838 account not because it was deliberately excluded from the 1832 account, but because Joseph, by 1838, recognized just how significant that was. Uh, I, I don't think he realized just what a blow to Trinitarianism that was in 1832. I think he probably recognized that more in 1838 and all of this kind of thing. So I, I don't think Joseph realized uh how that would be perceived as a discrepancy. I think he was remembering what his experience was. Yeah. And, and 
earlier I said I agreed. I agree that there's uh, that the Book of Mormon is. I don't want to say completely, but relatively way more than you would expect, uh, considerably more than you would expect uh, if Joseph or some other person in the 19th century is the author of the book. And if there wasn't years and years uh, of time to write something down and then take those writings into the room and simply dictate off the papers that the Book of Mormon is much more consistent uh, than it should be. Uh, under those circumstances, and that the first vision is has more inconsistency in it than the Book of Mormon. So I just want to grant that. I think the the bigger issue, because for me, the first vision is not as serious either from that angle. But the other side of the coin, the reason I think members are drawn to say like, oh, there must be something there. And then when they find either discrepancies or what they perceive to be discrepancies, they are felt as much more serious is because what I think is the more serious issue around the first vision. And we've already hit on this with the, the idea of treasure digging. It's this whole thing of the 1832 account being cut out, being put into the church historians vault on some level. We're removed from the very conversation and thought process of that event happening. It being cut out and stored away. Oh, right. What, what we're left with is a second and third hand story of when Joseph Fielding Smith, who was called as church historian in 1921, sometime it's believed in the 30s or 40s, uh, he cuts that out, puts it into the church historian's vault. And whether he cut it out or whether someone under him cut it out, I know like the apologists want to say like, we don't know that he cut it out, but I think that's not fair. I think it's I think what's fair is to say that whether he cut it out or whether someone else cut it out, they did it under his direction. I think that's entirely fair to say, and I think it's entirely possible and probably likely that he did it himself. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, On top of that is the idea that if we read Stan Larson's, I think it's also a dialogue article, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but Stan recounts the history from Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who I know that faithful will look at them as anti-Mormons who can't be trusted. But I I think for the most part, they're they're pretty honest about trying to deliver information. They may draw the tanners, uh, more critical conclusions. The Tanners, even more than uh, they are for the CES letter, were the source for the Godmakers. And the, but the thing that a lot of critics of the church don't recognize is that the Tanners are coming at it from not the same kind of perspectives that Jeremy Runnels is coming at it from. Uh, the Tanners are coming from it from a fairly fundamentalist Christian perspective. They're trying to prove that the church is satanic, not that the church is false. And those aren't necessarily the same things. Right. But even as Ed Decker did the Godmakers, the Tanners were, I think, relatively critical of him and his approach to that production. Uh, um, I, I think they felt like Ed Decker gave them a bad name. Uh, that may be a, a retrospect. I'm not sure. I think Ed Decker, I, I don't know. That may very well. No, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. Um, my point here being that uh, as Stan Larson writes his article, as the Tanners are sharing their input, as Stan Larson reaches out to other sources, uh, what he gets back is from, uh, I, th- I believe, at least two sources, is that Joseph Fielding Smith believed the 1832 account to be a peculiar, that's his words, right again, second or third hand, but those are his words, and that he really didn't want this thing to be public. Um, Once the rumor gets out, then he goes to, I think it's Paul uh, Chessman uh, at BYU, who's, I believe, a student in the final years. He's got to write his thesis. He's at the end of his education. And Joseph Fielding Smith tapes the 1832 account back in, goes to Paul and says, here's this, uh, you know, right, essentially either A, you've already decided on your thesis on the first vision, or I'm suggesting to you that you write about the first the first vision. And here's this 1832 account. We want you to include it so that the church is the first to talk about it and not the critics. I think, again, we, we weren't there and I'll grant that, but I think that's fair enough to say like, that's probably what happened. Uh, sure. And the question then becomes, all right, well, how significant is that? Because, right. well, well, because there are many members of the church, including Jeremy Reynolds. I mean, he's not a member of the church anymore, but when he was a member of the church, uh, 
he considered the prophets to essentially be infallible or close to infallible. Uh, and the idea that they could do something this stupid, and I think it is something stupid. I think it was dumb to think that that you can hide something in a church vault and no one's ever going to find it. Uh, I think that's kind of nonsense. And I think I, I, I would think probably Joseph Fielding Smith uh, felt like he was doing the right thing, felt like he was protecting members from information that might hurt them. Uh, and I think that's a terrible, stupid, uh, misguided approach to history. And I, I am grateful to see that the church is cor taking steps to correct that. But I, I don't think there's any question that the church has not been as forthright as they should have been, as we should have been. I keep saying they as if I'm not a part of it, as we should be. We need to be forthright about things that even are, that make us uncomfortable. That's one of the things that I found frustrating about Elder Corbridge's address again is that he didn't explicitly say this, but the idea was anytime you encounter information that might shake your faith, it's coming from someone who is trying to deceive you. And I don't think that's true at all. Uh, I, people can encounter information that shakes their faith in the church's essays. They can encounter it from faithful sources. And we need to be able to address that information and address that rather than try to hide it. So, Do you also agree, because it seems to be the message, not just Elder Corbridge's talk, but also, uh, the the Renlins, Renlins right. who just gave Sister Renlin and, and, and Elder Renlin right. just gave a presentation, yeah. um, and also the Gospel Topic Essays has a little commentary at the very bottom of the front page to that. Uh, in Elder Ballard or Elder Oaks, it feels like institutionally the Church has the message, and I could point to specific quotes. It's not just something I'm making up that the church is saying, look, there's lots of information out there. Make sure you go to the trusted sources. Make sure you go to the, the place where you're going to get an accurate portrayal, stay in the church's material. And I, I think you'll agree, the church has probably been, over the course of its history, one of the worst at telling its story accurately. Does that make sense? And that it really isn't fair for it to say, trust us to tell you the the accurate full story? Uh, I don't know that I would agree with that. I wouldn't say the church is one of the worst. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'll keep going back to Scientology, uh, but you have organizations and groups. I mean one of the worst within Mormonism. So if, if I want to know the in and out of Mormonism, if I look at the church's history, was it the best place to go to get an accurate telling and to get the full story. Well, okay, but then well, we, now we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but what do you mean by the church's history? Are you talking about Sunday school manuals? Yeah, I think that's a, the correlated material. Well, correlated material is a lot of stuff um, because pre-correlation, you had Hugh Nibley writing really bizarre, wonderful Sunday school and priesthood manuals. Uh, and there's magnificent stuff in there. And a lot of that was sort of squeezed out uh, during correlation. I, I, I would think that correlation, I, I would say that correlation didn't do any favors to the church recounting its history. But I think that there are pre-correlated materials that are really, really quite good. And a lot of them were distributed to the church as a whole. So I, I think just indicting the church as a whole and saying, no, the church has been Nothing but terrible on this. I, I don't think that's a fair assessment. I do think it's a fair assessment to say the church, the correlation ended up being a negative in terms of giving an accurate portrayal of the church's history. And I think we are moving away from that. I'd like to see us move even further away from that. Do you sense that the church wants members to be a little fearful of information outside the correlated material? Fearful? Uh, maybe. Yeah, I, well, uh, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think that's how they're thinking about it. Does that make sense? I mean, that may be what they want, but I don't think they, they know that that's what they want. I don't think that's what Elder Renlund intended to say in his presentation. I don't think that's what, 
I, I think what they're they're trying to deal with all of a sudden a, a brand new paradigm. I hate the word paradigm, but there it is, a brand new paradigm about how people ingest information and how they gather information, and they're trying very hard to sort of uh, fit that into the old box, and it's not working, and it hasn't worked, and so now they're trying to figure out, well, okay, if that's not how it works, how does it work? Well, let's see if we can figure out how it works. And I think we're in the process of figuring out how it works. And I think we're making great strides, but we're also doing some missteps along the way. And that's the way all organizations do it. That's the way any kind of change of culture happens. So I, so I, I would grant to you, uh, in terms of practice, yes, I, I don't think the church has done this very well for the last number of years. Um, and I think we're getting better at it. I don't think it's coming from a place of malice or deception or dishonesty. I think that the brethren are doing everything they can in their power as according to their understanding as to what they need to do to be able to address the new world that we live in. Uh, and I think that that's very difficult for them, for a number of them. And, and so, so I look at it and I think I'm just a little more generous in terms of um, assessing their motives. I think it's coming from a good place, even as they make mistakes. Gotcha. So let's begin to tackle the Book of Mormon. I've probably got, I don't know if you have a specific time you have to end. I've got to be done by 940-ish, so maybe okay. another half That's an hour. Fine. That's fine. So let's start to tackle a little bit of the Book of Mormon. Um, the, the trouble is, is this is such a complex issue, because it doesn't just involve the words on the pages. It, in, it involves whether the stories could have happened or not. It involves uh, translation issues. It involves, uh, you know, Richard Bushman is kind of the, the quote we all point to in terms of 19th century material in the book. It, it talks, you know, we have to get into the witnesses. We have to get into anachronisms. Right. right. This is complex. Right. Um, so let's start. And let me, let me say again, we've already, we've already hit on the translation. You've already acknowledged, like, look, it really doesn't matter if it's a stone in a hat. It doesn't really matter if it's the Nephite spectacles. And my pushback only was that I think the reason we avoided a stone in a hat was because it points back to treasure digging. You seem to have agreed with that. Yeah, I agree with so that. So I'll set that one completely off to the side. So the next issue I've got listed here is the, the impossibility of the stories. Now, we could argue that nothing's impossible if God's hand is in it. God can do anything. God can make the anything happen. God could build Noah's ship for him with a snap of a finger. So we could, we can point back to supernatural God magic. Right. Uh, and I use that term. I don't mean that as mocking. Some people have said, Bill, you shouldn't say that because it sounds like you're being sarcastic. I'm not. I'm trying to point to a specific kind of miracle, which is that which is completely unexplainable and so extravagant that the, we can only say God's in charge of it. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I want to point out that the Book of Mormon, at least in the narrative, contains relatively few of those. I mean, the Old Testament contains all kinds of nutty cuckoo stuff, right? People turning into salt and whatever else. Uh, Do you see those as myths that were added into the story? Because I think that's important to our conversation. Um. I don't mean across the board, but would you would you agree that to some extent, many of the extravagant stories most likely have very little historical founding or have been at least to some degree, I want to say highly embellished along the way? Uh, I think, you know, the, the, there's a there's a, a guy named Ben Spackman. Do you know him? He's written a bunch about this. Where yeah, talks, Ben's Ben's uh, been with Fair Mormon, and and I used to be with him as well. So I'm I'm familiar with Ben. Yeah, yeah. Ben Ben makes the case, and I think he's absolutely right that 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 kind of dichotomy between the figurative and literal is sort of a modern understanding, and it's not how anybody who would have been around when these things were written would have perceived these. Uh, that that is to say, uh, the Old Testament writers don't don't try to make any kind of distinction between what is figurative and what is literal, what is myth and what is reality in a 21st century context. They're telling the story in a way that they think is going to have the greatest kind of impact to the re to the listeners. And they're, they're not bothering 
to try to distinguish between what could be verified in a court of law and what could not, right? So, so, so I mean, so I guess the best way I can say it is when I look at an Old Testament story, uh, I believe there was a guy named Noah. I believe there was a flood, and I believe that he had a big boat with lots of animals on it. Now, do I believe that uh, that flood killed everybody on the earth and covered the entire earth on, an, on in a baptism? I think that's entirely unlikely, um, and, and I don't think I need to believe that to understand what the story of Noah is trying to say and, and what it is that the writers of the story of Noah were trying to teach. So, so I look at that and I, and I say, you know, I, I don't, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think a lot of those Old Testament stories are scientifically defensible, nor were they written to be. And so I don't really care much how much of it is actual history and how much of it is completely is mythological in, in a modern context. Um, I, I don't believe, for instance, uh, that the book of Job is in any way historical. Uh, I, 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 the, the idea that God and Satan make bar bets about people, uh, I just look at that and go, this is nonsense. And there's no way any, I, I think that was probably a, a dramatic presentation, a play, you know, that's kind of te trying to teach theodicy, the idea of why bad things happen to good people. But I don't think, uh, I think there may have been a guy named Job who had bad things happen to him. Uh, but I, I don't think that reading that as if it's some kind of police report uh, of exactly what happened is a productive way to read it. Yeah. And the trouble is anytime I push back, like we're going to have to have a conversation. Right. So, so, so I'm sorry. trying to choose which things we push, we push on. But the idea of Job for me, man, I really just don't want to go here, but I, I think it's important for the listener to hear this. I, I'm going to grant that you have, an additional pushback to my pushback, but I really don't want to spend time on <laughs> okay. it, which is that when we mention Job being fictional, but teaching important lessons, I grant. Uh, then why what is we run Dr. into Covenants? Then, yeah, Dr. Covenant, when, when God tells Joseph Smith that thou art not yet as Job, to have him be a fictional character, which I also agree with you, by the way, that he is a, it's a, it's a myth story. Um, that may have been known to be myth originally, but somewhere along the way, and maybe originally, uh, was imposed as a literal story, and now we've taken it as literal. Uh, the idea that God would say to Joseph, you know, thou art not yet as Humpty Dumpty, because Humpty Dumpty, while I'm being funny and facetious, Humpty Dumpty also teaches something, right? Like, we use these stories to tell kids and teach them things. Um when we when we impose a fictional if God imposes a fictional character as literal to Joseph, I, I struggle with a little bit of what feels like a deception there. I, I don't okay, see so God I, saying anything about literal or figurative nature of Job in that. Sure, you're not but, like Job, right? Uh, um, I, I mean, God obviously wants the story of Job to be able to instruct people about how to deal with pain and how to deal with suffering, and and He's saying to Joseph, "You're not like Job." I, you know, right. It's we, still useful when we tell people they have the patience of Job, uh, which is something that we still do in a modern context. I don't think yeah. we're weighing in on the historicity of Job. Uh, the, the principles of the story are clear enough that when we use that analogy, they understand what we're talking about. And when the Lord says to Joseph, you are not yet as Job, he's telling him this could be worse. You could have your friends turn on you the way they turn on Job. Whether or not Job actually was a real person or whether he's a story, uh, his friends turned on him. That story would resonate with Joseph Smith enough that that lesson would be taught. I, I mean, I look at that and people say that and I say, nowhere at all does he say, and by the way, Job really was a historical figure. I, I, I mean, we, we do that all the time in the way we talk about stories and the way we talk about you know, in, in general conference. Uh People will quote Shakespeare, and they'll talk about Shakespeare characters. And they don't stop to say, by the way, Hamlet wasn't really a person. Hamlet is made up. Everybody recognizes that. Uh, but the lessons that you learn from Shakespeare and the lessons you learn from these characters are still relevant. So, so yeah, I, 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 
I don't really, I've never ever seen that as a problem. But so I, I don't know if we're talking too long. Yep. And I, and I, yeah, and I sense that would be the very pushback you'd give it. And I grant that, like I, I see it both ways. Um, I think I also need to ask this before we jump into the actual Book of Mormon, which is now to go to present day and, and to say it this way. As history has become verifiable, as we grew as cultures moving through time, gaining the ability to be more journalistic, right. to have witnesses to events, to record those events in ways that if someone said a magic unicorn showed up, we now have the ability to say like, no, we can now show that it's almost absolutely certain that a unicorn did not show up, right? Like we now, and, and even to present day, where we have smartphones and we can record anything. Th there was this meme um, that showed like the moment uh, journalistic newspapers and witnesses became something that we could intelligently gather and look at miracles essentially go down to zero. And then the moment like Photoshop is invented, it goes back up again. I, I want to use that just as kind of a, a framing, which is that as history becomes more verifiable, as we are able to, with some certainty, determine whether things actually happen the way the one guy reports them or not. I assume you're going to agree that the really extravagant supernatural miracles I don't even want to say all but, because I want to say almost completely. They completely vanish. Um, do you agree with that, that we live in a day, I don't want to debate whether there's smaller miracles or not, because I think that's up to interpretation, but that the miracles that can only be attributed to uh, a supernatural magic coming from God seem to have all but ceased? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't grant that. Uh, what I would grant is that I think the language used to describe what happened that is read by modern audiences that makes it sound like magic. Uh, I, I think those kinds of miracles happen now and, and we don't acknowledge them for what they are because we can understand the science behind them. For instance, when you talk about, when you go back to the uh, book of Amos, for instance, and that talks about how the word of the Lord will cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea, uh, he's describing sort of a, a miraculous kind of event. Well, uh, what if you what if you went back and told Amos that a, a guy can stand in Salt Lake City and he can speak, and in real time anybody on the planet can hear what he's saying? Uh, how would he describe that? My guess is he would probably describe it using language that sounds like this is magic. You know, it's Arthur C. Clarke who said any any advanced sufficiently advanced to technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I, I, I kind of look at it that way. I think that a lot of the things, if we had a, you know, if we had a TARDIS and we went back in time with Doctor Who and saw what had actually happened, a uh, 21st century person could look at a lot of it and go, oh, well, no, no, she didn't turn into a pillar of salt. She was blasted by a nuclear blast or something, you know. They, they, they'd be able to have modern language that would, would describe that in a way that didn't sound as magical but which the ancients would interpret as magic. So uh, that's kind of the way I look at it, is that I, I think that, uh, uh, and, and I am also open to the possibility of the kind of, of major supernatural miracles that we're talking about happening. But it's what's interesting, though, is, again, the Book of Mormon doesn't have those things in it, for the most part. I, with, with the exception of Christ appearing in the Americas, uh, you have really mundane, ordinary things happening. Um, you have wars and you have people coming back and forth. You don't have people miraculously. Uh, I, you, I guess there are exceptions. I guess you're going you're to point to the Jaredite barges and the stones. Um, yeah, not just that. Let me give another story, which is, um, well, let me do this first. So if we relate back to other scriptural text in the world, I don't mean scripture as in us Latter-day Saints accept them, but, but sacred texts throughout the world. If we take, for instance, the Bhagavad Gita, right. and, I don't, and I don't expect you to be familiar with it. I don't know if you are or not. Uh, just enough to be dangerous. I got you. So in the Bhagavad Gita or the Mahabharata, which is the larger book that the Bhagavad Gita is within, there are stories of talking deer and, you know, right, magic right, right. spells and, and them working and, you know, people being 
having spells put on them and then, you know, dying and then their spirit goes into a deep, like there's just stuff that you and I would go like, yeah, yeah it's just, it's, it's a, it's a completely mythological story right. with no real historical foundation. And I think sometimes we go into our own sacred text and we want to see something different than that. Um, so I just want to say that now, now my point being in the book of Mormon, we run into, let me just use a story of the 2000 stripling right. warriors. 2,000 kids with no battle experience, teenagers, right? right? Essentially. These 2,000 stripling warriors go into battle against a larger, older, experienced uh, army. Right. These 2,000 stripling warriors are, none of them are killed. Oop, none of them are killed. And uh, they many of them, it says, are wounded with serious wounds that they faint. Uh, then these 2,000 stripling warriors get better and they return to battle. Okay. In the real world, 2,000 teenagers going up against a more experienced army and not a single one being killed is impossible, implausible. It, it Even... Even if I make space for God to have his hand in it, I can't make sense of that. And on top of that, once these kids are wounded with serious wounds, I'm expecting gangrene. Right. I'm expecting um, serious infections to the point where these kids lose arms and legs. Well, how do you know they didn't? Uh, yeah, I, well, because it feels as if the story is telling me that these 2,000 go right back into battle soon after. Well, and on top of that... Nobody faints from blood loss in an age of medicine that they had at that time without somebody dying. Right. Uh, right. That just seems reasonable. You know, I watched the Civil War, and if I took every hundred people who fainted from blood loss, my guess is probably 80% of them died. Well, sure. It, it's, I, I don't understand why you're comparing that to stories about magic spells turning people into deer. Because I think I, I think we're we're talking about something uh, that that I mean because when you start talking about you know mythical fairies turning people into deer and and magic spells and all of that kind of stuff I think that's far removed from this kind of stuff you know have you seen the movie Three Hundred where you yeah I've seen the movie Three where you have the three hundred people that, that's supposedly based on something historical I think it's probably nonsense but. But, uh, you know, there, there are – this comes back – this comes back to the idea of, okay, uh, the people who are telling you this story, um, what kind of context are they telling you this story in? For instance, okay, I've got Helaman saying, all right, none of my warriors were killed. Uh, okay, do we get a follow-up letter from three months later where he talks about the number of people who died from gangrene? We don't. Um, now if we read that and we assume, well, this is God telling us absolutely that none of them did, the, the text does not make that claim. The text, we don't get any kind of a follow-up. We don't get any kind of a medical report as to what these injuries were, how serious they were. Um, th there are also, I can think of a number of plausible ways that a small inexperienced army can defeat a much larger army that involves superior technology, that involve uh, better territory, that if they have the high ground, if, they, if they're covering, you know, there are all kinds of details about this that we don't get and we don't understand. And if we were to travel back in time and watch, we would be able to find and say, well, geez, this is why you won, buddy. Henry V won the Battle of Agincourt because he had the longbow and was able to shoot the French from a distance. Now, you read Henry V by Shakespeare, and he talks about how God fought with him and all these things, and you, and he's using very Helaman-esque language, and you say, no, you won because you had the longbow and they didn't, right? And, and so you have to go and say, okay, well, the Book of Mormon writers, how are they perceiving this? And they perceive this as a miracle, and I think they're right to do so, but that doesn't mean that the miracle defies scientific understanding. And for us to say, well, we now have all of the scientific information and we have a forensic report of exactly what happened on that battlefield and what Helaman is saying is dishonest. 
I, I think that's making way too many leaps with the information we have. We don't have any idea what happened. We just have Helaman's perception of it. And, and that's what we get in the Book of Mormon. And, and it's very far removed from the kind of fanciful fairy stories that you find in myths. You know, nobody's, you know, Narcissus isn't looking in the river and turning into a flower. Uh, this is, this is, you know, these people had a really tremendous military victory. And yeah, it just, it just seems to me, and I grant that if, if other details weren't in the story, I grant that not being there in the battle, we don't know what took place. But once we understand that many fainted from blood loss, and I think it does use the word many. Right. Um, well, what you're getting is Helaman's report. Right. Right. But Helaman is in charge of the army, right. and so on some level, either I have to accept, I got three options. It's either all bullcrap, okay. it's 100% true, or on some level, Helaman is telling the story differently than it happened, but there's some historical basis to it. Well, and, well, Helaman may be telling the story. The, the point is, Helaman is telling, I, I think, I think the, uh, the most reasonable explanation of that is that you're getting Helaman's story as Helaman understood it. Uh, does Helaman understand, Helaman understand the story perfectly? Uh, no human being understands things perfectly. He, I mean, Helaman didn't have air drones and all kinds of reports to be able to give him an accurate uh, casualty report in the way that you can get in modern times. We, we, we can, we now have the ability to be able to pinpoint exactly how many casualties have happened and my guess is that, you know, if Helaman's writing this letter and then maybe a day later he gets told, well, actually 30 people were killed over here and you didn't hear about it until now, uh, that, that strikes me as the way history actually works. What you're getting is Helaman's understanding of what happened. And I don't think he was being deliberately dishonest, but that doesn't mean that he was infallible either. I, 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 because to say that this is exactly what happened, you have to say Helaman is an infallible na narrator here. Helaman is reporting this. He has complete access to all of the information, 100% of it, and what he is giving me is a scientific treatise that I can take into a court of law and say this is exactly how many casualties there were. I, I, I just don't think the text sustains that, nor was it ever intended to. And I think I think that uh, that's... that's uh, you know, uh, uh, straining at gnats and swallowing camels. So it sounds like regardless of the motives, like that seems like what we're debating, regardless of the motives, the, the, the facts of the story, um, you, you're making space that they may not be. I'm making space that there are errors in the Book of Mormon which the Book yeah. of Mormon announces on the front page. If there be errors, they be the mistakes of men. That's on the title page of the book. The idea that this book is infallible, particularly in areas of forensic history, uh, I, 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 I just don't see why anybody would try to make a case for that. The book never claims to be that. And, uh, and so... You know, when you say, okay, well, geez, this, this just doesn't match up with what we understand of modern forensic science, uh, the book, the, it never claims that that's what it is. The Book, the book of Mormon never makes that claim, so I, I don't really feel a need to defend it on that basis because it, it, it doesn't try to defend itself on that basis. Yeah, and, and my pushback, and we're going to end here probably shortly, but my pushback is, and again, by the way, I'm loving this. I just, I'm really I enjoying it too. I, I, yeah, I, good. I'm happy to keep doing this. Good, good. The, the pushback I would give is it feels often to those of us who have doubts or who have left the church with the conclusion it's not what it claims, that whenever we get to these kinds of issues— we we soften them up a little bit. We say, hey, look, people are fallible. Things may not be exactly as they're told. But what? But there's a bigger problem at hand, which is once we make space that the stories may not be as we're told, there are repercussions and consequences of that collectively. And I simply want to make space that as we go through the conversation, I grant 
Helaman may have told the story to the best of his ability, but it's inaccurate and that he doesn't deserve to be crucified for that. And we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater for that reason. But what happens is that when we get into the Book of Mormon and we look at the Jaredi barges, for instance, when we look at a, a transoceanic vessel of Nephi, when we look at the Tower of Babel uh, being spoken of both biblically as well as in the Book of Mormon by two cultures that are removed in such distance from that event, and that event is almost certainly an embellished story, and then these two cultures with so much time between them and distance geographically between them for them to then go back and tell this story so similarly poses for me like, ah, that doesn't feel like it's the most rational, logical to assume that these two cultures get divided geographically and then are divided by significant amount of time and then tell the same story. That that becomes hard for me. Um, when I look at two men being in a prison with enemies and the prison comes crashing down and these two men walk out and no one else does. So I see these stories. When I see Shiz um, get his head lopped off and it says that that he raises up. And again, the apologists say like, well, maybe they hit this nerve and maybe he still quivered and moved and got up on his elbows. Or like, again, I understand we make space for things to be like, hey, if you make these allowances, it will be, uh, there will be space still to have faith in this thing. That's a very different conversation than saying, look, I want to be the most reasonable, rational, logical I can be, knowing I can't be completely reasonable, rational, logical, I grant, but trying as much as I can to be objective, to look at it. Um, without a need for it to be true and say like, what's most logical, rational, and what are the repercussions in, in, um, oh, what's the other word? The repercussions and uh, consequences of making these kinds of spaces and what does that mean for our theology collectively or what prophets are today collectively? And it, it just becomes messier uh, and it opens up new conversations that compel us to begin seeing this very differently than the way the institution wants us to see it. Um, and, and I'll stop there. I'll let you respond. Um, I've got about four minutes before I have yeah. to end. And I'm happy to let you also pick up in our next sure. sit down to finish addressing this question. I won't, I won't, I won't cut you short if you feel a need. Well, to. Well, sure. And I, I, I'll try to respond fairly quickly because I think actually uh, what you're talking about is a great weakness here, I think, is, is to some degree the church's greatest strength, or should be. Uh, I think that we need to say that agency and infallibility are incompatible, and we need to scream that from the rooftops. Uh, I cannot have faith in the idea that the Book of Mormon is a magical, perfect book written by magical, perfect people. Uh, I can't exercise any faith in that. That doesn't animate me at all. The idea that these are people who are like me. I am not perfect. I am not magical. And these are people like me with failings and weaknesses and problems and that make mistakes. Uh, that is a story I can invest in and have faith in because these are people like me who have reached out to the divine and they've gotten answers and they've gotten support. And they've also struggled and they've also had all kinds of problems. Uh, that, to me, is the much more powerful message. And so when you look at that and say, well, gee, how can I exercise faith in this if it's not a perfect book, which is essentially what – that's the way I'm hearing. And that, that may not be what you're saying, and you may want to push back on that. But that's kind of what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that if, if this isn't perfect, if this isn't exactly 100 percent historically accurate – I mean, I don't think Helaman is lying, and I don't think he's inaccurate in the sense that he's saying, oh, yeah, nobody was killed. Oh, it turns out everybody was killed. I think I think that he's not giving you details because he doesn't really know them. Uh, I don't think he's being dishonest, and I don't think he's providing bad information. I think he's human. And the idea that he's human and that all of us are human and that this is the experience and this is the message of the Book of Mormon, that humans who have problems and are making mistakes and are even making mistakes as they record their problems, which is what all of us do, uh, 
these are humans who have had this experience with God, and you can have these experiences with God if you exercise similar faith. I think that's just a far more powerful message, and I don't think it's a message we ought to shy away from at all. I, I love that. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back, and I'm going to let you respond to it next time we sit down. Okay. Which is that if I look at the stories and I say, look, 2,000 stripling warriors <clears> – <throat> 2,000 stripling warriors based on the, my reading, and I'm, I'm just being as objective as I can be, and I'm not objective. Uh, I get that. When I look at that story, I say, ah, it just feels so unlikely. And, and even if I grant some of these allowances, it just, it just doesn't fit. And then I, list, you know, I go to the Tower of Babel, and I go, ah, it just, it just doesn't make sense. That feels unlikely. And I go to the transoceanic vessel, and I go, ah, I know the, what the apologists say. Like, maybe it was this kind of a boat, and one guy somewhere in history did that. Like, it just doesn't feel likely. And then I get to 10, 12 other stories, the prison coming down and men walking out. I go, ah, shit, that just doesn't seem logical or rational. And, but, and every single issue taken on its own, we make these allowances, and you're like, ah, all right, I'll, I'll just take it. When I get to the point where I have 12 or 15 of them, my brain starts to go like, it's, it probably didn't happen. The, the book seems to be fictional myths. And by the way, again, uh, pointing back to your father and his work and other things like it, there's also the other argument, which is let's set those things aside and let's look at these things. And those things then begin to make an argument that there's something real and historical going on. I grant that, and we can talk about that next time. Um, but I want to say that for the critic, for the doubter, they see so many implausible, unlikely, improbable events that need major allowances to make space for them to work that they determine at the end of the day, like, uh, yeah, it it feels like it's just mythical fiction. Um, and so what we're going to do, I, we'll have to end here. And I don't, I don't mean that. I just, I wish I could go 10 more hours with you. So let's aim for some time next week. And I'm happy to do one or two of these a week until you're uh, exhausted with me. <laughs> because I think, again, I think people are going to love this. I hope so. I'm yeah. certainly enjoying it. Yeah. And I think you're making, you're making what I think is a, a plea for faith that for those who, because those who don't want to believe are going to find ways not to believe, and those who want to believe are going to find ways to believe, I think you're going to satisfy those people. Uh, I think the question becomes, as you and I go back and forth, it's those people in the middle, and, and they're going to be torn as we're having this conversation, and this conversation uh, has a, is useful because I think it's balanced, and so those in the middle are going to have enough to add to whether they say like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm just, I just decided this isn't enough for me to stay. And others are going to say like, oh, my goodness, I didn't hear it posed this way. I'm going to hang in there. And I just think that's the beauty of this conversation. So let's pick up next time. Okay. Um, and I'll probably wait till these are all recorded before we release them. All right. So that people can just go right through them one through the other and hear a consistent conversation. But I, I just want to say, Jim, I think the world of what just happened in the last two hours, and uh, I can't wait to, to sit down on the next one. Well, I, I just want to thank you very much for this opportunity. I think this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate, I, I think your approach has been, has been wonderful. I, I appreciate the perspective, and I hope that more people can have conversations like this. Perfect. Let's, uh, let's pick this back up next week. <laughs>